DJ John Michael, thank you for joining Hustlers at Home. I miss you, friends. Uh, seriously, I'm like, I'm ready to like get up and like hug my computer. <laughs> I re <laughs> no. really miss you, my friends. Real. So I, you've been giving me life with the COVID disco. So thank you for literally Drew. Drew comes into the room the other day and he said, John Michael just totally turned my day around with the COVID disco because I was on these conference calls and I think, I mean, seriously, I think that that echoes like a lot of people's sentiments. So thank yeah. you for being a light in the world. Please, I'm trying. It's like, you know, you got to find your own thing. I actually, I feel like with everything that was going on, I took like a break over like the last few days. And I was like, I feel like we're in such an intense moment that I didn't, like I, I battle with the, do I continue to do this and give that up moment or do I give space for what's happening? And I think that's sort of the balance that we're all kind of struggling with. Yeah, for real. Especially when I feel like when we do what we do, you know, because we're so like in the industry or in the business of being like so up and sort of giving that positive vibe and we're so used to doing it. And it's like all of a sudden now it's like everything's been challenged and everything's been changed. So it's yeah. Like, I'm so glad that you bring that up because we are we are in the motivation and the inspiration business. We are in the uplifting business, but you also can't pretend that people are hurting and that yeah. we're in a very um, important and significant time. And the tone of those of these of the news and the civil rights movement that I'm so um, enthralled with and, and humbled to be a part of. Yeah but we also need rest and we also yeah. need recovery and we also need levity. And we also need moments where we just want to sing along with Cher and just yeah. like, like live, you know? And so I think as long as the impetus is rooted in, in what, in love, yeah. I, I, I hope it's received that way. Right. And not, you know, in the moments of levity are not in, 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 in ignoring what's going on and not ignoring the pain, but in fact, um, hopefully creating a foundation and a space for healing and a space for more yeah. activism. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because I tell my friends all the time because, you know, I'm in so many different group texts and everybody's like, you know, we're all looking at the same news. We're all seeing the same things. We're all sharing the same things. And, you know, everybody feels a little world weary by it, which is understandable. And I'm like, and I, <laughs> I keep telling my friends, I keep saying the same phrase. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And they're like, you have yes, been a telethon for too long. <laughs> <laughs> like, enough sports analogy, honey. You're like, you're in the third inning. Like, I know. <laughs> I'm like, but it's like, true though. I, like, I know. Because <laughs> that's why I said, even when I had done the, the talk with Big Frida for a Peloton. Yeah, which was amazing. Thank you. Thank I, you. Oh my Thank God. You. Give me so much life. She, she is so... She is so next level. Her swag is intoxicating. I know, but that's why I even threw it out, like when I was saying how, you know, it's still important, even though you feel overwhelmed by it all, to continue to speak truth to power, even if your voice shakes. And I was like, as my girl Robin would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. so true. Okay, so we're talking about pride. Yes. You are, I mean, you're, you're an icon <laughs> in my world, baby. Like, you are a gay icon, honey. So let's, let's. Let's spill some. Let's spill some tea. So, sure. uh, so, uh, so the Peloton. If if y'all are um, watching and you're part of the Peloton universe, you have to have heard of John Michael, and he's also part of our music team. So, what's your official title? It's associate producer of music programming. Correct. Mm. I mean, um, so we've got that piece of the background, but I want folks to know maybe a little bit of your your pre Peloton story sure. as a gay as a gay man and. Um, what, can you please just share a little bit of that? Sure. I mean, um, God, where do you even begin? It's like, uh, yeah, exactly. Tell me your life story. It's, not, it's fine. We only have, we have five minutes. <laughs> well, I mean, I, before I had come, I came out at around age 17. This is like 96, 97. Um, I had actually dated a girl for three years beforehand, which up until my current relationship was the longest relationship I had ever been in, which is wild to me. But, wow. and, oh my God, if you want to laugh, my song with my ex-girlfriend was Pat Benatar's We Belong. And I'm like, how wrong? How incredibly wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so silly. Every time I hear that song, I'm like, oh. <laughs> I was such a baby. I mean, yeah. 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 Oh, God. But, we all go through. Jeez. That is, that is, that's a, that's a chapter. That's oh, a significant. God, yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's, and you know, and it's, it's, it's funny because I, there's so many like full circle moments that I feel like have happened. Like I remember 
like the first pride parade I have I had ever gone to was in 1998 and I had by that point had met some people that were like we should go blah 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 and I was so nervous because I lived in Staten Island and you know at the time the city coming from Staten Island seemed like oh my god so much you know so much going on and there's so much energy and it's so crazy and I was like all right and I sort of like I didn't tell you know like my parents or anything that I was going I was just sort of like met up with them and like took the train, the ferry, the whole thing on the way in. And I was like, so, so nervous. I have a photo, which I can share with everybody later of me at my first pride parade. It is wild. And I remember being like getting there and getting off at Christopher street. And my, I was just like, you know, well, what do we do? Where do we go? There's so many people here. And I clearly remember my friend going, Oh, well that's Stonewall. So that's where we go. And we just go there. And we hung out in front of Stonewall, which even then this is like, pre-internet, I don't want to date myself, but this is like pre-pre-internet, like before it was really, really a thing. I didn't know anything about the movement. I didn't know anything about what pride, how it oh. began. So they just said, you know, well, this is Stonewall and this is where we hang out. And I said, okay, that's cool. I had never been, I mean, I was 18. I'd never been to like gay bars as far as that goes. So I said, all right. And we just hung out, watched the parade. It was the most insane thing I'd ever seen because it's like, Staten Island was so, um, I don't want to say closeted, but it was so far removed from that. And it was so not anything like that. So to be really around that many people, that many LGBTQ people and allies was, it just never registered in my mind that it would be a thing. You know, because I feel like up until that moment, I had always heard gay in the context of being somehow bad. You know, this is coming off the heels of the AIDS crisis. And this is, it was just a very, very intense time, but this was when attitudes were starting to change. And then Will and Grace happened. And I feel like, oh. but you know- So do you, no, I mean, no, but the arts, I mean, I, I really believe the arts are an entry point to understanding uh, yes. humanity, even if it's a limited, you know, fictional yes. view. So yes. for so Will and Grace was was pivotal for you. Pivotal because I mean, I at the time like because I know that uh, Queer as Folk had sort of come around around the same time. I don't know. I think Will and Grace might have been first. I could be wrong on that. Don't get me wrong, but they were around some similar times. And at the time, I wasn't DJing. I wasn't really into like nightlife, nightlife at that moment. And it just seemed like, oh well, this is the stuff that people frown upon. This is the stuff that I had heard back home that, you know, you didn't want to be a part of that. And it was, it was dirty and this was where trouble was. And I didn't really understand because it was so much outside influence. Later on, I realized mm -hmm. when I started going to gay clubs that like that was my light bulb moment where I was like, oh no, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. This is the moment. This is what it is. And I think that Will and Grace was sort of like that sort of safer version where I'm like, oh, well, there's people that are like me, like. I can't even tell you growing up, people were like, oh my God, you're just like Jack McFarlane. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. My father used like to, it. my father would always be like, that man, he's the funniest man on television. I'm telling <laughs> you, that's my father talks like that, but, <laughs> but yeah. And it was, that was a big deal because I think that was the first time for me that I had seen like a positive viewpoint of gay people. And it was like, you know, the gay best friend living with the girlfriend. And I had had that up until then. Like I had had girlfriends and I had had friends that I had confided in. And so seeing that I was like, oh, finally I can see something that looks like me, something that's myself, which is what yeah. I think the arts do for anybody in a marginalized community. But I mean, just, it's such a, representation is so important. Yes. And visibility is so important. And that's where I think the entertainment industry sort of comes in. You know, and I, it's even like, and I, t I tell people all the time, I feel like Will and Grace and all of these other things that have come before me set the stage for someone like me or Cody or Maddie to succeed at Peloton. Because I really do believe that those were the sort of things that broke down barriers. Because when you have... I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but if when you have I love it, please. Know, when you have that in your home, okay. Let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna sidetrack. I watched. There's a documentary about Betty White on Netflix. And she, I know you love the golden. Oh my God, so, every night of my life. Every night of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a there's a documentary, and they were they were talking about her, and she said, you know, when you see celebrities on the on the big screen, like like a Jennifer Aniston, and you know, they're untouchable. 
they're 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 uh, not and uh, Jennifer Aniston, Angelina Jolie. Like they're just very very untouchable. They're movie actors. They're in Hollywood. It seems so far away. But when you're on a screen in someone's home, it's very personal, and people feel a sort of they they're very endeared to you. So I feel, and it took me a long time, even through the lens of Peloton, to sort of understand that. Because I didn't really get it. I mean, I'm famous for saying I had no idea what Peloton was when I started. <laughs> but I, I remember. Yeah, I was like, what? I don't know what this place is. Okay, there's cameras here. That's weird. And, um, <laughs> but I really, and I've understood that over the last almost six years now, is that when you, there's a power to being in someone's home on that small screen. And there's, 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 you can touch people in a certain way that I think even for me with Peloton was extremely surprising that I was like, because I didn't really get it. And like people would be, even with you guys, I was like, wow, people feel so strongly about this and I don't really get why. And it kind of took me a long time. And to be honest, I just got a bike a few months ago. And even then it was like another level where I'm like, oh my God, I see it. I totally see it. You know, and like, I listen to the things that you say and I laugh and I'm like, oh my God, that's so funny. Like, you know, and it's, I catch myself in those moments and it really is, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing. So I do... I think that those things were so important and that visibility and that representation means everything. Because when you are only told, whether it's by your community or religion or whatever it is, that this is bad, this is wrong, this is different, it's other, that weighs on you. And so when you finally get to see yourself in other things, you're like, I'm not the only one. I know there are other people like me out there, I just haven't found them yet. What would you say to someone who's watching who might still be very much in that place, either geographically or for limited, um, for any reason, disenfranchised for any reason as an LGBTQ plus person? I think it's, it's very, very, I mean, my instinct is to say leave, <laughs> but because I think that that was such a big part of my process coming from Staten Island. And I don't want to completely shade Staten Island because I know we've made a lot of strides in the last 20 something years. But at that time, it was so, I mean, there was still rural farmland there when we moved there. I mean, in like the early eighties, this was like cows and, and, and stuff. Like it was like super like farmland. It was not huh. developed at all. Like there are still like, there's deer everywhere. If you drive where my parents live, like there was not a lot of houses. Like I remember when they built like the tiny shopping mall near my parents and I was just like, oh my God. I was like, there's like things here. There's like a video rental store. Like I couldn't believe it. I can get a VHS tape. Yeah. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, and it, 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 I think it, everybody's level of tolerance is so different. And I, I went to an all boys high school for the first two years. It was terrible. It was a terrible experience. I didn't want to go there. It was one of the best schools on Staten Island. I'd take tests to get in, whatever. And I was always a good student up until that point. But after my relationship with the girl ended, and I realized by that point I had known, I mean, for many years before that I had known, but there came this point where I was like, I have to take charge of my own life. Mm. Because as much as I want to do for my parents and do for my family and be a good person, it started to become very clear that this was not fulfilling to me and this was not really my community. And I didn't know what that meant. And it meant breaking the rules sometimes. And it meant sneaking out of the house. And it meant making mistakes, making lots of mistakes. Dear Lord, lots of mistakes. But to sort of like take that control and be like, no, I need to figure this out for myself. And I, there's no one right way to do that you know I even said it in, in one of my last rides with Cody too is like you know the road everybody's road to pride is so different you know mm -hmm. it's not linear it's so complex and there's so many things that you're going to come across and you are going to make mistakes and it's messy but and I think I commented on one of your your posts about it and I had written you know you have to lean into the things that you think make you different they're what make you special and you have to learn to clap uh, to what did I say? I don't even remember what my, what my own saying was. It was, uh, you have to remember to appreciate yourself before the world learns how to clap for you. Whoop! You, I you, just you, heard a fan <laughs> go off from the heavens. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> There's got to be one here somewhere. More fans, more fans. That's when I comment on all your COVID I know. <laughs> but it's true. And it's like, you know, it's, it's I think 
Now it's probably a different game because of the internet. And I feel like even like I have a 16 year old nephew, the things he knows and the kids that he is friends with, mm -hmm. they know so much more than I ever did. And they're so much more self-aware than I ever was for sure. And it, that's kind of like amazing to see and it's very inspiring. And my nephews told me about, you know, times when he's stood up for kids in his school that he knows are bisexual or that he knows gay kids and whatever. And they don't, they're growing up without the same filter that I feel like our generation grew up with. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. is, it's, I mean, you have to go out there and you have to find, there's no, you know, there's no one way to do it. And there's no, you know, if, if you look out and if I see, you know, well, all of the gay men that I look at are all chiseled and muscly and, 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 okay, that's great. That's them. And I appreciate them. And that's that, but other things can be true, you know? Yeah. A I lot grew, of lame. Oh yeah. I grew up very much a musical theater queen. I know that's so shocking, but, <laughs> but I grew up very, very much doing that. And I took ballet for years and I was like very, very into musical theater and they were a completely different type of gay person. And it was like, well, I think that I was just like, well, this is me. This is who I am. This is what represents me. And then I, over time I was like, no, but I'm allowed to be more than one thing. Yes. Oh my God. Uncheck all the boxes. Yes. 100%. And create our own sandbox. Like, yeah. Yep. Yep. So obviously we're, we're all immersed right now as we should be in the Black Lives Matter conversation. Where, where for you or how for you does that intersect with the gay rights movement? Well, it's, you know, and it's funny because it's like, as I'm watching and I'm reading all of these things and having all these conversations, I feel like there is, there are so many of the same struggles. And I feel like there is, there's a certain base level for most minorities. I think that you would probably meet there some way as a woman, you would meet on some of them as a Latina woman. Um, and like I said, you know, I've always said, I sort of move through the world unchecked as a white man. No one really like to look at me no one bats an eye. I just sort of, whatever. I'm in an interracial relationship with a brown man. You know, he, over the last six years, has taught me things about the world that I just never even considered. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I, while there are certain base things that are for sure the same that we meet on, which is the one thing that I would hope all minorities can come together on, is that sort of, you know, it's not the oppression Olympics, but we all have these things that, okay, if we band together, we can really fight for the greater good. Just what's happening now, though, when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, if you think about it, if you pull that statement apart, Black Lives Matter, matter. That's all we're asking. Matter. Just to matter is wild to me. And the fact that anybody could come and debate that, I'm like, what are you actually saying here? Because we're just... Agreed. You know, and it's it's so like there there are times when I look at Brian and I'm like, what is going on in the world? Like it seems like we are in the twilight zone because it's like, and this has been going on for hundreds of years. And I tell everybody, you know, we, I think that we've had it pretty good as far as a country goes, considering that it took this long to get here. You know, and it took an eight minute and forty six second video to make this happen. You know barring all of the other ones that were not filmed or the other ones that never saw yeah. Jesus. You know, the Breonna Taylors. Even if you go back to from Rodney King till now, it's the same script. Yes. And I think that people have just gotten sick of it. So I think that, you know, and even within the gay community, there are still issues. There's still racism. You know, you would think that the being a part of minority would, would band us together, but we all, we still have so much work to do. Mm -hmm. I think that as long as we continue to be honest with one another and say, you know what, look, this is going to be complicated. This is going to be messy. And I'm not always going to get it right, but I want to be informed. I want to listen. And I want those things to be a teaching moment to me because mm -hmm. there have been times where I've discussed things with Brian and he'll be like, no, this is why and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I posted on my Instagram, uh, maybe a week or so ago, a talk that Brene Brown did. You know, we love Brene Brown. Love. Uh, I mean, my heart. But, and she talks about, you know, the, the true way to empathy is you have to believe everybody's stories and their life experiences as they tell them to you. Yeah. 
And Tunde quoted Brene Brown in her Speak Up ride. And yeah. I was like, exactly. <laughs> it's not through my eyes. Yes. It's through your eyes that yes. this narrative matters. And that's what I think. And that was, I think, the biggest thing in, in to come to allyship with the Black community for me was that I realized in actually really learning from Brene Brown was that this is not about my voice. My voice doesn't actually matter in the sense that this is not my experience. I can't speak to it on any level like that. My goal with whatever platform I have, or even if you don't have a platform, you know, don't, I don't want people to misunderstand, you know, just because someone has X amount of followers, that doesn't mean anything. Change begins in your circle, in your home. At your kitchen table, honey. It's It's like at at the water cooler. What are you speaking up about? Yes. Yes. And so it's, you know, what I learned is that it, 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 if I can elevate voices, I've posted things, you know, I have I've clips of James Baldwin and Toni Morrison and just speaking about their lives. And it's like, listen to what they're saying, because that's the true way to empathize with people is to say, oh, this is your experience. I believe you, because why wouldn't that be true? You know, and Brene mm-hmm. always says, you know, I think that because um, Tunde and I had actually talked about this before her ride. And I had said, you know, it, what she had always says is that, you know, the, the more whiter, straighter, Judeo-Christian that you are, you're sort of taught that the way that you view the world is the world. And that yes. the other version of the world is sort of other. Yeah. And I can't take that lens off my face. This is, the, I see I'm a white gay man, you know, and that's the way that I see the world. I have my own experiences. I've had my own hurdles. But as a black man, as a black woman, as a black trans person, I have no idea what that's like. I have no idea what interactions with the police are, what interactions are when you go anywhere, you know? So it's, it's my job as a human to just sit here and be like, okay, this is what you're telling me. How do we fix this? Because oh, yes. It's so, it, it, that what you're saying is so simple. Like, it, not, that yeah. it's a, the, not that it's easy, but it's just like, so simple it's mm-hmm. just to look at this person's experience and take it for what they're saying it is as Brene Brown would say yeah oh gosh so what um what do you say we get into some trivia okay. so you so you you are my music aficionado okay. <laughs> and you are always busting out in our DJ rides like we're not even talking about b-side we're talking about like c d e f <laughs> sides of, yes, of yes. tracks and factoids. So I'm gonna set a clock for one minute Uh-oh. and you're gonna see how many of these you can answer. I'm sweating. Um okay here we go. Uh, to be honest I would have not gotten any of these so if you even get one I I oh my I, I god but I look for you. No pressure. Okay. It's fine. It's exam time. It's, it's no pressure. It's fine. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Also known as the also known as the queen of bounce. This also our artist has been heard on Beyonce's formation and Drake's Nice for what? Big Frida. <laughs> Prince played guitar on Madonna's Like a Prayer. True or false? True. Ooh, Lady Gaga's 2011 Born This Way was inspired by which song released in the 70s? In the Express Yourself. Carl Bean's Gay Disco Anthem. I was uh, born oh, this way. Because that okay. I know Patrick. Sorry. Okay. Well, take table it. Pa- Patrick Har- Patrick Haggerty was one of the first openly gay country music stars. Was the founder and leader, lead singer of a band called what? Oh, uh, um, uh, Lavender, La- um, Lavender Country, Lavender. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Before writing music for the likes of Pink, Christina Aguilera, and Gwen Stefani, Linda Perry was the lead singer of which rock band? Four Non Blondes. Mm. All right, last one. The singer who came out as gay later in life released hits such as It's My Party and You Don't Own Me. Uh, Leslie Gore. Mm. Yes. Got it, honey. Yes. That was really good. And, with, and they were long questions for me to read out. So you didn't have very much time. <laughs> so you got one, two, three, four, five. Five, like, serious music trivia. Like, you are on my Trivial well, Pursuit team. So it's funny because when we talk about Born This Way, so there was a lot of uh, co- um, controversy at that time because people felt that it was ripping off Madonna's Express Yourself. Um, oh. which Madonna's Express Yourself is also a take on a soul song from the 70s called Express Yourself by, I want to say the Staples Singers, I could be wrong on that. It's some gospelish group. Mm. And I had worked prior to Peloton, my DJ residency was five years in Asbury Park 
for Shep Hedabone, who co-wrote Vogue and produced all Janet Jackson remixes, like a legendary wow. producer from the 90s. And they, and he, him and Madonna, while I was working there, got sued for the horn sample in Vogue by some company. It was a long, long involved story. And so one of the things that I had done for him at the time was to sort of like help his case, which is kind of shady and Lady Gaga, I'm so sorry, was I took the vocals from Born This Way and laid them over the instrumental for Express Yourself and they match perfectly. And I was like, here you go. I was like, in case you need something for your court case, you know, here's this. <laughs> And it's so shady, and I'm sorry. I mean, they ended up winning. Job, job, Michael was a paralegal for a day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I can be a little Carmen San Diego if I have to. <laughs> you had the trench coat. <laughs> you remember the trench coat? Yes. <laughs> I live. I live. I live. Oh my God, God, I miss you. All right, so we're almost out of time, and we we could talk for actually oh hours. Uh, do, do you have a question for me? Actually, yes, because and I'm surprised that we didn't even get to Burning Man in this entire half hour. So I know. I know. What I want to know from you is, I know that you've got, how many years did you go? Have you been? Ten. Ten. Obviously, Ten we're not row. going this year. I know. I know. It's very, very sad. I'm literally, every other day, I'm like, I can't believe we're not going. I'm like, I'm just going to I'm think actually up. still in denial. I have waves yeah. of denial. Like I'm like, Brian, I'm going to go stand in the sun just every once in a while, come and throw sand in my face. Throw <laughs> sand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... What was, do you have like a, a pivotal moment when you were there, when it could be your first time, it could be your fifth time, where you like, you were just like, oh no, this is, this is my place. Like, this is for me. I, I don't think I really appreciated it until I was in the throes of my life as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And that was my only, I mean, running and Burning Man were my only two places where I could feel whole. Um, so it was probably a few years in, I would say probably my fourth or fifth year when I was really in my, in my legal career. And it was at Burning Man that I was like, I can't live for one week a year. Yes. It makes no sense. And that's when I started plotting my way out. And, um, and we've discussed at Burning Man in recent years. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like a place I hold sacred. Mm -hmm. But I'm not escaping my normal life. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's illuminating all that I appreciate in my day to day. Yeah. So I think that, 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 was, that, that was really um, transformative for me is, is, is creating a life that I didn't feel like I needed to take a vacation from. Mm -hmm. But also recognizing that there are things in this world that need so much change. And part of what is so beautiful about Burning Man is that there's freedom and acceptance and community completely suspended from commerce and there's something really really um beautifully sacred about it oh, as yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> I'm, no, preaching, I'm preaching to the choir well, but yeah that, that that was my journey on it and seriously for everybody and it was like i've known robin now for a little bit over five years and she was always for like the first two years she was like you have to come you have to come i'm like i don't know girl i'm not an outdoorsy kind of person i was like we'll see i don't know it sounds terrible it sounds really hot and i'm super white so i don't know about that <laughs> but that first you, I don't even think you were on there for more than 20. You were like, bye, gotta go. Like I'm whirling dervish, like in the dust, like Tasmanian devil well, style. Like, it, was it was like was, another, it was another aha moment. Like when I went into the first gay club, because I, when we drove out into the playa, I was like, yep, everything's been leading me right here. This is the moment. Oh. This is it. Yeah. So thank you. How, where can folks find you, my friend? At DJ John Michael on Instagram. Um, I'm at DJ John Michael on my I have a Facebook page. If you want to find me on Mixcloud, it's mixcloud.com backslash DJ John Michael. Um, but yeah, I mean, Instagram, if you go to my Instagram, there's a link tree in my bio and it'll take you to everything that you need to know. Oh my God, the world needs so much more of you. And if y'all are, are, are jonesing for some DJ rides, we have plenty with Jess King. Well, lots of instructors, but mainly yeah. Jess King, Cody, and myself on demand. Um, I love you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you for being a light in the world. I miss you. It, 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 I ache. I ache I to see you. I know. Seriously. <sighs> Thank you for being on Hustlers at Home. Right. And I hope y'all appreciated this combo. Leave comments below. And um, sending y'all so much love today especially today. Mm -hmm. Peace.